Okay, welcome back to the class. Right now we are going to complete the second part of our lesson of today and we are going to have breathing. The new story that we have today is Into the Eyes. Before we start this story, we will have something. Who can remind me what is the three things that we are going to focus about? The genre and the author and the question of the week. Excellent. So we have genre and author and question of the week. Okay, this is what we are going to focus about on the beginning of this story. At the end of this story, we are going to take the main idea and the summary of the story, okay? Before we start, I want you to go to this video and to watch it with me to have a little hint about our story of today and what we are going to learn. So let's go to this video. What drives people to explore harsh climates and dangerous places? Ever since we could walk, humans have explored our world. It seems maneuvering through varied climates, terrains, and cultures is a challenge we can't resist. The push to be the first human on the North Pole was big news in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The temperature on the North Pole averages minus 34 degrees centigrade in the winter. This harsh climate would prove a huge challenge for even the most experienced explorers. Scientists and explorers tried reaching the pole by dog sled, by foot, and even by balloon. But Robert Perry is given credit for being the first person to reach the North Pole. Perry was unconventional in many ways. He was innovative in that he relied on the Inuit who lived in the region. He learned from their mastery of survival in the harsh climate. Many regions of the Arctic are not uninhabited. In fact, the Inuit still live in this region in areas of Alaska and Canada. They use snowmobiles to get around now, but back in Perry's time, dog sleds and snowshoes would get them from place to place. Dr. Frederick Cook was also en route to the North Pole at the same time as Perry. In fact, Cook claimed to have reached the pole a full year ahead of Perry. The two men disputed each other's feet for many years. Modern-day researchers determined that faulty calculations in navigation by both men show that neither reached the true northernmost part of the globe. The desire to experience the unknown still drives humans to explore, from the top of the globe to the outer reaches of space. What do you think drives people to explore harsh climates and dangerous places? Okay, my girls. After this little video that we saw right here, now I'm going to ask you this question. What do you think that drives people to go to the dangerous places like to the moon or, for example, at the down and uh, the deep of the ocean? And some people go for the North Pool, for the North Pool and for the, for the South uh, Pool also to explore it, to the desert to explore it. Why they are going to these dangerous places to explore them? What drives them to be this? carriage people hmm. maybe uh they like adventure or maybe they want to die <laughs> <laughs> of course nobody wants to die okay but try to to measure it in yourself like if you are a teen and maybe one day you want to go for hawaii to explore it or for the amazon to explore the forests in there Maybe I will come to you and ask you, why did you choose that place? Why do you want to go to that place? Why do you want to explore? Huh, what do you think? What it will drive um, you to go? Like, uh, maybe um, I want to see this place and uh, like, uh, yeah, I don't want to die, but I want to see like uh, it's going to be dangerous or no. And uh, it's it's right to, to have uh, your family or your friends with you, not alone, because like, uh, I don't want to die alone. <laughs> so you bring the whole family to die with you. <laughs> well, this is a mean idea about <laughs> adventuring <laughs> and exploring. Oh my God. 
<laughs> this is really honest. Like, I don't want to die alone, so I'll bring my whole family. <laughs> Guy with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe because you want to explore that place, the desire of knowing what is living in there, what kind of animals, what kind of plants, what kind of people, yeah. how they are living, how they are you taking their information food. about this place. Uh -huh. that, how they are living there. Like, for yeah. example, uh, when some people went for, uh, for the Arctic and for the Antarctic, they found some people living there, by the way. These people, we call them the Inuit. Inuit, it means the uh, indigenous people that live in that area, which, mean, which means the original people who inhabit that area. Believe it or not, some people are living in the North Pole and some people are living in the South Pole also. Some people are living in the most dangerous places and the most cold places on the earth. Uh, and those people, we call it the Eskimo people. The name of this tribe is Eskimo. They are living in there. Their whole life is in the cold places. They build their own houses out of, of ice. And they are, uh, if they want to hunt for food, they open a small area inside the ice and they try to hunt and to fish for uh, the, the sea seal or for uh, some fishes for some sharks, some whales, they fish them and they eat their meat for the whole year. So their, their whole diet and their whole food depends on fish. But they exist, they live in there for, for a long time. They are living now since maybe more than 100 years and they are living there. Dennis, where, where the polar pier live? What? Where the, uh, the polar pier live? Polar bear, you mean? Yeah. He will be there, but he will not kill people, mostly. He kill some type of animals if he finds fish, if he finds seal, if he finds any kind yeah, of... Yeah, so it's there. cold. How people can live there? Yeah, I will show you. Just a minute. Let me show you. <laughs> As you saw in the video, um, these are some pictures of them right now. Those are the people who are living there, you see? And they are similar to the Chinese, by the way. But subhanAllah, yeah. they are living in the North Pool and the, and the South Pool also of the Earth. How those people came in there, nobody knows. Until now, nobody knows where did they come from and how they exist in there. Nobody knows. But they live in, in their type, how they survive. You see why we explore? Because when we go there, we will take pictures of them. We will come to sit with them and ask them how you live, uh, how you live, and how you you eat, and how you wear your clothes. So how they wear the clothes when they kill the seal of the sea, they take take the meat and whatever uh, the skin of that animal, they take it and they make it as a what as their clothes. This is one thing. Sometimes they take the fur of the dogs when they die, the fur of the polar bears if it died. They will take it and they make their own what their own clothes out of it. But how they live, they don't have houses. They build their own houses out of snow. Oh. We call it the ice igloo. This yeah, one. yeah. This one. Okay. I know. So this is how they do it. They bring the ice and they cut it into little blocks right here. And they put it block uh, above a block until they make it a house. And they live inside it. Believe it or not, when you live inside it, it's very warm. Although it's all made of ice, but subhanAllah, because it cuts all the air, it isolates all the air and all the snow and the wind from outside. So it becomes very warm to live inside it. So there's they don't have a blanket. They have their own blankets made of fur, made of the skin of the animals, but it's really warm for them to live in there. And then how they go from place to place, they go in the slides that is uh, driven by the dogs, like this one. This is how they transport from one place to another. And when they want to go to, uh, to take a water, they will go there to the places that have- Very water. cold, everything Very cold. is cold. But this is how they live for a long time, more than 100 years. And when the explorers went for uh, the architect to explore it, 
they found those people living in there already. Oh, imagine. So this one, the, yeah, it's unbelievable, but it's it's there and it's real. So this is why for us, for the regular people like us, when we go for those areas, we would think like nobody is living there. But when we go, we would be amazed, like some people are there. How they reach, you never know how they reach. And by the way, they have their own language, their own culture, their own uh, civilization. Nobody knows how to speak like them, by the way. So if you oh. want to go there, you have to learn their language to communicate with them. So it's very magnificent because today we are going to have a lot of information about this part of the world, while all the people don't know anything about the Arctic and the um, Antarctic. But today, inshallah, we are going to uh, speak about it in deep. So this is the uh, uh, Arctic right here, and this is the Antarctic. Ant Antarctic is bigger, way bigger than the uh, the South yeah. right here. Way bigger, as you can see. <clears throat> Okay, my dears, let's start and go for our books in the page 26. All of you open it and Watin focus in here since you don't have the book. The genre of this story that we have is narrative nonfiction. What does it mean narrative nonfiction? It means that from the word narrative, it means that it's a story. I will tell you a story. I will narrate for you a story. But this story, it's nonfiction. It means it is real, real story. So all the heroes inside this story, all the people inside this story are real people. So narrative non-fiction, non-fiction, it means it's not fiction. Not fiction, it means it's real. Because fiction, it means imag imagination. So the opposite of it is real. So narrative non-fiction, it means that it's a real story. And who is the writer of this story that we have? The writer, it's written by Lynn Curl, uh, Curly. Lynn Curley. This is the writer of the story. And the question of the week is what drives people to explore harsh climates and dangerous places? So let's go ahead and write it one by, the, by one. So who can tell me what is the genre of the story? Narrative? Narrative nonfiction. Nonfiction. Very good. Which means it's so what? It's a real or imagination? No, it's a real story. It's a real story. The author is Lynn Curley. Lynn Curley, very good. And the question of the week: What, what um, drives, uh, what drives people to what to explore new places? Because they want to bring their family and die with them. <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and, and read. I will let the first part of the reading by, uh, by the reader right here, and then after that, you are going to read. This is the first character that we have. His name is Hansen, Frederick Hansen. Let's go and read about it. Page 29. Fridhoff Nansen and the Fram. The great pioneer in the search for the North Pole was a brilliant young Norwegian scientist named Fridhof Nansen. Also an athlete, outdoorsman, artist, and poet, Nansen wrote of the strange atmospheric effect called the Northern Lights. The aurora borealis shakes over the vault of heaven, its veil of glittering silver, changing now to yellow, now to green, now to red. It shimmers in tongues of flame until the whole melts away in the moonlight like the sigh of a departing spirit. In 1888, at the age of 26, Nansen organized his first expedition, a trek across Greenland on skis, a feat never before accomplished. Dropped off by ship on the uninhabited east coast, Nansen and five companions had no choice but to ski westward to civilization, carrying only the provisions required for the one-way journey. This kind of bold yet calculated risk-taking was typical of Nansen. He carefully planned every detail, even designing his own equipment. 
He also knew how to improvise off the land, adopting Inuit methods such as the use of dog sledges, kayaks, and snow houses. After the Greenland trek, Nansen became interested in the idea of polar drift. In 1884, in the ice near Greenland, some debris was found from the Jeannette, a ship crushed in the ice off Siberia in 1881. There was only one possible explanation: the ice and debris had drifted around the entire Arctic Ocean. Nansen had a breathtaking proposal: he would sail a ship directly into the ice pack off Siberia, deliberately let it be frozen in, and drift with the ice across the top of the world, penetrating the heart of the Arctic. Nansen's small ship, the Fram, onward in Norwegian. Was specially designed with a hull that would ride up over the crushing ice and living spaces insulated with cork and felt. Fully provisioned with scientific equipment and supplies for five years, the Fram had workshops, a smithy, and even a windmill for electricity. On June twenty fourth, eighteen ninety three, the Fram sailed from Norway. By September twenty fifth, Nansen and his crew of twelve were frozen fast. In the polar ice pack off Siberia. Okay, my girls. <clears throat> This is the first part of the story, and with the character Nansen. This person is a real person. He's a Norwegian per person from Norway, and we know that Norway is very near to the North uh, Pole. Okay, and what makes this uh, person fascinated about the North Pole? That every time he go for that area in Norway, he will find what. The lights of the North Pole. Let me show it to you. If you go for Norway, by the way, you will find a lot of something like this. Okay, they call it the the North Pole lights. Subhanallah, when the when the night comes, when the when the uh, sun goes down and the night comes, you will find all night long you will find colors like this and lights like this in the sky. These lights they uh, differentiate between the green color, the blue color, and then the red color, the purple, and all lying on all night long you will find what different colors that comes and goes. And everybody didn't know at that time. I'm talking about 1883 and 1885. Nobody knows what is the reason for those things, but obviously it's related to to the cold weather that we they have at at there at the north of the Earth. So this person, his name is Hansen, was fascinated about those lights, and this person was a poet. He he's a writer. He's a poet. He's an artist. So he was very fascinated about those lights that he wrote about it many times, and he said that I don't want only to write about it. I want to go to discover what is the area that comes after Norway and in the north of the Earth. What is that area in there? And is it all only snow? All of it is snow, 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 a desert of snow. I want to go to figure out myself and to check it out myself. So he started an expedition with five people. His first expedition started at 1888 with five people. He started by taking、uh, enough provisions and everything, and he went with the ship. And the ship started that、uh, trip to take him at the beginning of the world, of the North Pole. When they started in there, he went to the west to the what to the Greenland, to the Greenland. The Greenland is in the west of the North Pole. And there he went in there, and then he he has to walk for a long time because the the ship will stop at a certain area in the North Pole. They can't go further. Why? Because it's full of snow. Then the ships they can't go further. So the ship has to sail until the water ends, and then they say, "Diala, you have to go down by your own and to walk." Of course, you can walk in the snow, but if you walk for snow on the snow for a long time, you will be frozen for death. So what he's Started to have is what he started to have some、uh, strategies and some techniques of the Inuit people. Those techniques using the dog sledges, kayaks, and the snow houses. He started to use sledges to go over the snow because if you walk for a long time, you can't do that. You will be frozen. And then if there is water between the snow, he used kayaks. K- 
kayaks is a type of boat like this. It's a type of boat that is enough for two person or three person, five person or one person like this. So this kayaks, the, the, the importance about this kayaks that they can go in the small creeks, in the small rivers, in the small areas of water. So he used it to uh, go from one area of water to another. Okay. And then he used also dog sledges like this. Those are dog sledges. The man will stand on a sled right here and the dogs will just uh, go and drive it on the snow. Then he will not feel the, uh, the cold of the snow on his feet like walking and it is faster than walking. So you can go for a long time and a long distance by just this sledge without hurting yourself. And it's very fast. So he depends on what? And also snow houses, like the Inuit people. Snow houses, as I told you, it's like igloo houses, let's say. It's made of snow, this one. This is igloo house, you see? And they enter from this small entrance. Somebody would ask, why, miss, they, they make the entrance this is small? Why can't they make yeah. it bigger? What also, the make? animals can't uh, go inside. Uh -huh. The animals, like the polar bears, they can't go inside. This is one thing. Another thing, so they can be protected. Another thing, if they made the entrance bigger, then the, uh, the wind and the snow will enter the place. Then it will not be warm for them. Okay? But if they make okay. it, this is small, then they will be protected from the snow, from the wind, from the polar bears, from any other danger that is around them. And it will be super warm for them to stay for a long time. And they, they can even start a fire inside. But a small fire, of course, if you make it big, it will melt down. <laughs> okay, so this is an igloo house, the one that Hansen uses just to survive in that area. Okay, he went to what he went to Greenland and he was discovering this area until he found what he found he found a debris of a ship. This ship, what the name of this ship is Genity. This ship was uh, was crashed since a long time in Siberia in 1881 and he found it in 1884. Okay. And this ship, nobody know the, where is the crash of this, uh, where is the, the prey and where is um, the remaining of that ship until he went in there and he found it. Siberia, Aslan, where? Siberia is in Russia. This is Siberia. Siberia. <clears throat> Let me show it to you. Um, where is Siberia, Siberia, Siberia? Oh, this is Siberia. The, the Siberia here is in Russia. Let me show it to you in the globe. It's better. This one. This is Siberia right here. This is Russia. And this is the North Pole. Okay. There was a ship right here in Russia, in Siberia, that was crashed since a long time. And then they found it after three years. They found it where? They found it here in the North Pole. Hansen found it. So when he found this information, it blew his mind. And he said, how? It went all of this area from this distance to come in here. How? Then he thought like after that ship was crashed, all the snow and the water drift that ship until it comes here okay so he had he found this theory he told the people that anything that crash in here all the current of the water it will bring it here into the north pole and he found this theory he came out with it hansen small ship the fram then after that after many years, he started to say, okay, I need something to make me go further inside the snow. So I need some type of a ship that I have to make it especially for the snow. This ship, he called it the Fram. What he made on it, he made it what? 
he made some a uh, windmill on it, which means that uh, some type of device that it changed the wind into electricity and into power. And then he found, he put on it a workshop that he can make his maps, he can make his writing. Uh, and then he put a smith in there, smithy, smithy, a person who works on the ship to help him with the ship. And then he put a specific device on the ship to make the ship push the snow in front of it. Yani after the water finish, there will be a snow in there. Then how the ship will go further? He put a small device that it will cut the snow to, so he can go inside the snow. Why he made all of this? Because he want to go further inside the heart of the snow and the heart of the North Pole. Let's go for the next one and see what happened next. This is his ship, you see? Uh, this is the way that he made it. He made a workshop. He made um, uh, a windmill. This is the windmill. It's like a fan that changed the, the wind into electricity. And he has electricity on his ship. This, we are talking about 18, at the time of 1893. So it was since maybe uh, 150 years ago, almost. So it's good that he has electricity in his... As they drifted slowly northward, the expedition settled into a routine of scientific observation. The ship was so comfortable that by the end of the second winter, Nansen was restless and bored. Now, only 360 miles from the North Pole, Nansen decided to strike out over the ice. In the Arctic dawn of mid-March 1895, Nansen set out with one companion, Yalmar Johansen, three sledges of provisions, 28 dogs, and two kayaks. As in Greenland, there could be no turning back. This time their home base was drifting. For three weeks they struggled northward, maneuvering the sledges over jumbled fields and immense ridges of broken ice. By early April, they were still 225 miles from the pole, and the drifting ice was carrying them south almost as quickly as they could push north. Provisions were also running low, so they reluctantly headed for the nearest land, 300 miles to the south. As the weeks passed and the sun rose higher, the broken surface of the ice pack became slushy, then treacherous as lanes of water called leads opened and closed between the ice flows. It took four months to reach land. After provisions ran out, the men survived by hunting seals in the open lead and by feeding the weak dogs to the stronger ones. Nansen and Johansen finally found a remote island. With no hope of rescue, the two men prepared for the winter, building a tiny hut and butchering walrus and bears for a supply of meat and warm furs. They survived the winter in isolation, burning greasy blubber for heat and light and growing fat on the diet of oily meat. When the ice broke up in the spring, Nansen and Johansen set out in their kayaks. On June 13, 1896, one year and four months after leaving the Fram, they were picked up by an English expedition. Two months later, the Fram and its crew broke free of the ice in the ocean east of Greenland, more than a thousand miles from their starting point. The scientific expedition was a triumphant success and Nansen and Johansen had gone farther north than anyone had before. Okay, this is the end of the first part of our story and the end of the Nansen, uh, the Nansen expedition. Now, Nansen made not one uh, expedition, he made two expeditions. The first one, he, it started in, as I told you here in the first part, it started in 1888. This is the first exp expedition. When he went in there, he walked, walked, walked for a long time after the first ship uh, uh, put him on the ice. He walked for a long time, but then he went for the west and went for the Greenland. So he didn't went further inside the, uh, the, the ice. He found himself lost and he found the crash of that, uh, of that ship that I told you. Then he went back and he said, no, this is not working. I need a bigger ship that can drive me faster inside the ice so I can go further. So he made his own, uh, next he made his own what, he, he made his own ship right now uh, at 1893. His own ship, it's called the Fram. And then he went again into the ice. 
with the ship that he made. His ship was very good that he, it went with him for a long time into the heart of the ice until he found the place that he wanted and he started to walk from there. He left the ship and he left all the people on, on the ship and he took only his companion, one companion. His name is Yilmar Johansson. So now Nansen and Johansson, they went together walking with the dogs, with the 20 dogs and with the provisions and with two kayaks just to go inside the North Pole to discover more and more. And they said, if we have more men, then they will keep us back. We need only to be lighter. So I need only one companion. He took his companion Johansson and they went in there. By walking and going to the sledge, they went for 200, uh, they went for a long time, but still to reach the, the heart of the pole, they need 225 miles, not kilos, miles. One mile, it means 1,000 kilo. Yani imagine how many times they have to walk. They have to walk like 225 miles just to, to, to reach the, the, the heart of the pole. Now, when they went in there, of course, the, the cold was more and they couldn't walk for a long time. They couldn't go for the sledges more time. Then they have to stop many times and they have to uh, to change their plans for many times. What happened is at that time, their provisions went short and they don't have enough food. What they have to do, would they just uh, surrender and say, we will die? No, they started to what uh, to hunt for seals, for some fish and try to eat it. And also when the, when the weak dogs die, they try to feed it for the other strong dogs just to survive because you are talking about unbelievable conditions. Nobody can survive in those conditions. We are talking about minus 70 degree. Yeah, I mean that the temperature, it would be minus 70 or minus 80 degree. At those conditions, nobody can survive. So you have to be a person that you are searching for uh, substitutes. And uh, if you don't have food, what you gonna do? If you don't have good dogs, what you gonna do? So you have to feed the weak dogs for the stronger ones. You have to hunt for your food. You have to make your own houses. You have to walk for a long time. So after that, in 1896, which means that he spent three years in this expedition. And since the time that he left the ship until he walks all this time, he spent one year and four months walking and just spending the time alone with Johansson. So Nansen and Johansson spent one year and four months walking in that area. After that, after spending one year and four months just to trying to explore that area and write what they saw and what is the place and what is the path that they took, after that, uh, an, uh, an English expedition found them in the middle of the north and they took them back to their home. And that uh, expedition was what was a triumphant success, which means that it was a great success for Nansen and Johansen. And they had information that nobody had before. And they were the first people to hit the North Pole alone and to explore it alone. So this is the first name of any person that hit the North Pole was Nansen and Johansen from the Norway expedition. And those were the first people. Do you think that other people will come to explore the North Pole or that's it? Um, uh, yeah, other people. Yeah, there will be other people. But the, what is the story of those people and what they discovered? Is it the same information of Nansen or different information? Would, be, would they be also Norway or maybe English or maybe French? This is what we are going to learn in the next story, in the next part on Wednesday and okay, Miss, can I ask a question? If, yeah, they're, if they're like living in this cold places and this cold area, if like uh, they, uh, they, ha they uh, is tired, like have flu, uh, uh, have a fever, how they're going to recover? Of course, they have their own, uh, their own things. For example, the diet that they follow at that time, what is the diet and the kind of food that they are eating? They are eating a lot of fish, a lot of oil, a lot of, of the juicy oil things that comes from the meat of the seals, they eat it. So this thing can make your body so warm 
and it can give you a lot of immune immunity against the diseases. This is one thing. Another thing, when they uh, get cold or something, they will eat something that is uh, going to make them survive. Those tricks and those secrets, the Inuit people knows it. So that's why before they start their, uh, their expedition, they go for the Inuit people. Why? Because those people know how to survive and how to cure yourself from the diseases that comes from the cold. Because those people live on those areas. So that's why at the beginning of each expedition uh, and the information about it, what you are going to see that starting, they are going to, to the Inuit people. This is at the start. Why? To take all the information from the Inuit people so they can survive in the harsh climate later on when they go in the heart of the North. Okay? So they have their own tricks. They have their own secrets. They have their own meats, their own food that is not similar to our food, Aslan. So if you eat Aslan seal meat right now, you will be so much hot that you can't bury yourself because subhanAllah, that meat give you so much energy and so much warmth that is only uh, suitable for the people who live in those cold areas. Understood, Watin? Yes. Yeah, Do you have any other question, my girls? Thank you. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the lesson of today uh, and I will see you inshallah tomorrow. Until then, stay safe and be okay. Bye-bye, my girls. Love you. Bye, miss.